Good morning, teachers. It's a pleasure and a great honor to welcome you all to the sixth EPI, Encontro Paraibano de Professores de Inglês, our sixth EPI conference. My name is Mariana Perez. I'm a professor and a member of the EFOPLI program, which stands for Espaços para a Formação do Professor de Língua Inglesa, which roughly translates into English as Teacher Education Spaces for English Language Teachers, the program at the Federal University of Paraíba in Brazil, which organizes the EPI conference. Our program aims at providing teachers of English with professional development opportunities, and we do this through a huge network of volunteers, teachers, professors who work in public and private schools and universities in Brazil and around the world, together with many other partners, including secretaries of education, consulates and publishers, just to name a few of them. Besides offering online and face-to-face -face meetings, workshops and courses, the FOPLI program also has social media profiles through which we share ideas, experiences and information about teaching. So if you haven't started following us yet, you can do so now. It's never too late. I would like to highlight that all of these activities are coordinated and implemented by a group of colleagues whom I'm very proud to represent here and whom I would like to mention and thank. And I'll go slowly with the names because of our interpreter. So I'd really like to thank Professor Ana Carolina Bastos, Elisabeth Souto Maior, Franciele Martini, Rafaela Souza, Tiago Magno de Carvalho, Pedro Ivo Caldas, Gustavo Dias, and the students Laura Bento, Renato Nóbrega, John Ryan Moreira, Maria Milena Gomes, David Rafael Paredes, João Vitor Cabral, and Lilian Juscelino. The EPI conference is one of these activities organized by the EFOPLI program, and it is no doubt our biggest action. This is a completely free of charge event that has, over the past years, gathered more and more teachers and offered a moment for meeting new and old friends, exchanging ideas and experiences, as well as working together towards strengthening education. All this has been made possible thanks to all of our partners, guest speakers and collaborators. A big thank you to all of them. As usual, this year, we'll have interpreters of Brazilian Sign Language for all of our live sessions. I would also like to thank our team of volunteers who have been working hard to allow more people to have access to our event. A big thank you to all of our helpers, our interpreters, Professor Edneia Alves, Poliana Stephanie, Clayton William da Conceição, and a very big thank you to all of the members of the deaf community who are here with us today. There is no doubt that we have been living in unprecedented times, but in spite of all the challenges we have been all facing due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we decided to organize our conference as we believe that this is a very important moment for the teachers in Paraíba, in Brazil and elsewhere. For the first time, the EPI conference is being held in a new format. If on the one hand, we miss interacting in person, seeing each other, on the other hand, this format has allowed the participation of new undergraduate students, teachers, professors and researchers who are attending EPI conference for the very first time. So a very, very warm welcome to all of you, first time participants and EPI old friends. Just for us to have an idea, can you all type in the chat where in Brazil or in the world you are right now? Thank you for being with us here today. For this year's program, uh, we'll have four moments of live broadcasting, nine recorded talks with various interesting themes, a lunch break and final remarks. Topics such as racism in language teaching, inclusive education, English as a medium of instruction, educare, the fundamentals of caring in a multicultural classroom, among many others, could definitely give us food for thought and action. 
We also have raffles and a final surprise, so stay tuned. And whenever you can, remember you can leave us a message on our Padlet. It will be wonderful to have a wall full of messages and comments to remember the sixth epi by. And remember to use our hashtag 6EPPI and tag us at Afopli UFPB. Now some details. During the live streaming, we'll leave the last 15 minutes for questions. Our team of mediators is ready to pass on your questions to the speakers. So if you have questions and comments, just type them in the chat during the presentation. So we hope you all have a very nice, happy experience and enjoy it with us today. Our program and our event are all about collaborative work, exchanging ideas, finding solutions together and supporting one another. No matter where you are in Brazil or in the world, education unites us. And it is through education that we all have been building new paths, new maps to help us live in this new world together. Let's all remember that we are never alone. I'll leave you with this quote by the creator of Mafalda, who has recently left us. So happy, happy conference, everyone, and thank you. Hello again, teachers, and welcome to our first plenary talk. It's titled Preparing Anti-Racist ESOL Teachers, Principles and Practices. Just a quick reminder, the speaker will have 45 minutes, and after that, we'll all have 15 minutes for questions and answers. So if you have questions or if you'd like to leave a comment, please do so in the chat during the presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker, Professor Luciana de Oliveira from the Virginia Commonwealth University, who is participating in the EPI conference for the very first time. Thank you, Professor Luciana de Oliveira, for accepting our invitation. We are honored to have you here with us today, especially on your birthday. So happy birthday. So Professor, uh, Professor Luciana de Oliveira, PhD, is Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor at Virginia Commonwealth University in the US. She has over 25 years of teaching experience in the field of TESOL, 
and she was the first Latina to ever serve as president of the TESOL Association. Luciana has authored, co-authored, edited, and co-edited 24 books and has over 200 publications. Among many awards and honors, she was the recipient of the Mid-Career Award by the Second Language Research Special Interest Group and the Early Career Award by the Bilingual Education Research Special Interest Group of American Education Research Association. In this plenary, Professor Luciana will be addressing the preparation of ESOL teachers for anti-racist work, acknowledging that racist beliefs and structures are pervasive in education and beyond. She will focus on principles and practices to tear down those beliefs and structures and build anti-racist classrooms. So Professor Luciana, I'm sure that we'll have a very important discussion here. Without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay, Poliana, thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, and it's an honor to do the opening plenary um, for this conference. Um, and I'm really excited to, to be joining all of you today. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. All right. Looks like everything is OK. If somebody can let me know, um, because I now can't see <laughs> the uh, stream yard. So I hope it's working OK. Um, so yeah, my topic for today is preparing anti-racist ESOL teachers, uh, principles and practices, and uh, specifically, um, just terminology, um, ESOL stands for uh, English to Speakers of Other Languages. So I'm really making this uh, broader than English as a foreign language or English as a second language. Uh, you know, that terminology is, is pretty typical, I think. Uh, we also use English as an additional language, but I prefer to use the term ESOL. So just a quick overview, uh, I'm going to address the preparation of ESOL teachers for anti-racist work, acknowledging that racist beliefs and structures are pervasive in education and beyond. And we focus on principles and practices to tear down those beliefs and structures and build anti-racist classrooms. So I have some guiding questions uh, to guide this presentation. And those include, what is linguistic racism and how do we fight against it? What power and privilege are present in the TESOL field? What historically racist practices have been part of TESOL? And what principles and practices uh, should guide the preparation of anti-racist ESOL teachers? So I'm going to start with um, some key concepts and also addressing this question. What is linguistic racism and how do we fight against it? So starting out with some of these key concepts. Racism, um, and I'm quoting here Kubota and Lin, um, who said, quote, racism can be viewed as both discourse and social practice that construct and perpetuate unequal relations of power through inferiorization, which is a process in which the other is rendered inferior to the self. 
And racism is often interpreted as overt forms of bigotry or prejudice rather than structural or institutional inequalities. So we need to see racism as a system. And we often talk about um, uh, systemic racism. So it really is part of a system of inequalities that go beyond the self. So that's why uh, we need to be thinking about these things, especially now in the context where we are around the world, and especially here in the United States, which is my context where I have lived for now most of my life. Um, we know the deaths of black people um, are now pervasive. They have always been, but now I think ever since the death of George Floyd, um, and hopefully you know the context to them that I'm talking about, um, you know, we need to be thinking about uh, more than just individuals who are racist, but also the system of racism and how it kind of um, influences a lot of what we have in our societies. And I know that in Brazil, it's also a very, um, a, a very common um, thing to be thinking about. I think it's a common, I, I, we need to be uh, reflecting on this concept, okay? What is uh, white supremacy? White supremacy is a notion that ideas, thoughts, beliefs of white people are superior than those of people of color. And whiteness functions as a norm. And a lot of people have this mindset, oh, I don't see race. So I'm saying, please, don't think that way because that is um, that is white supremacy in action. Now, going into specifically what is linguistic racism, I needed to talk a little bit about racism and so on before I went on to talk about linguistic racism. So linguistic racism is amplified, and this is De Costa uh, this year talking about this, and I quote, linguistic racism is amplified when a speaker is multilingual and shuttles between different languages and language varieties because more often than not, her ability to translanguage is seen as a liability instead of an asset, okay? And translanguaging is now a very common term in the TESOL field, and it really comes from bilingual education, but it's very, very common now across uh, different fields. And it really refers to using, uh, when a bilingual uses all of their linguistic resources to make meaning. So linguistic racism refers to ideologies and practices, and I quote De Costa again, utilized to conform, normalize, and reformulate an unequal and uneven linguistic power between language users. And it needs to be examined in relation to the social political context in which multilingual speakers are, are embedded. And it also needs to be examined in conjunction with work on linguicism and native speakerism. Okay, and I'll be talking a little bit more about them. What is then anti-racism and why we need to be talking about anti-racism? So these are practices of identifying and opposing racism by challenging and changing values, structures, and attitudes that perpetuate systemic racism and also implementing policies which actively oppose oppression in its many forms. So the way that I conceptualize anti-racism, it, it includes race, but it also includes consideration of various forms of oppression, including discrimination based on language, gender, sexual orientation, ability, class, for example. Okay. So 
continuing uh, other guiding questions that we have for this presentation. What power and privilege are present in the TESOL field? And what historically racist practices have been part of TESOL? So I'm going to ask you some questions for consideration, okay? And hopefully you can, you can type the answers down um, and we can have a brief discussion. I will stop uh, sharing my screen and we can have a conversation. So here are some questions related to racist practices in TESOL in um, considering teaching, okay? So who is represented in your teaching materials? What Englishes or varieties of English are represented in your teaching materials? Which, quote, English is privileged in your school or wherever you work? Are so-called, quote, native speakers, end quote, of English given prominence as role models of language. So, I don't know if you can interact with me or not, if I can see some, um, some answers to that, but you know, I just want you to reflect on those questions and then maybe at the end we can have a conversation. Uh, but the idea here is think about who is represented. So, yes, somebody's saying American or British English. That's the variety that is often represented, right? Um, what else? Who is represented? Do you see diversity? in its many forms represented in your teaching materials. I have a, a broken um, elbow, so I have to use this sling here. I'm gonna try to do it this way to be more comfortable. Um, so who is represented? Do you see a lot of diversity? Do you hear people say, um, that they need to have um, native English speakers as professors or teachers um, because they are the role models of language for us. Um, we see tokerism in the books, yes, so um, we have sometimes one black person, one Asian, dip, dip, representatives of different races, perhaps. Um, that is very, very common. That is true. Um, some materials bring only British or American English. Yes. So I'm going to be challenging this, these practices today because the way that I see this is that they are um, racist practices in our field, especially as it relates to teaching, okay? So yes, one single black person being representative. Um, so that's, that's exactly what I was trying to get at, okay? Um, we can't really see a lot of diversity in the teaching materials. So that's really true. And I think that that is something that um, we need to challenge. Okay, we need to challenge our publishers to be much more inclusive. And I'm going to be addressing more of that uh, this morning. So continuing with our um, presentation. What Ortega has said is that the language, quote, the language classroom proposes to develop monolingual competence a second time around in life. And that's what I'm going to be addressing here today as well. Actually, I'm going to be addressing that next. 
So what are some racist practices in the profession of teaching English to speakers of other languages? And I have this question for you. Who gets to be invited as plenary speakers at major conferences? What literature have you studied and cited in your work? So those of you who were scholars in TESOL, what literature have you cited in your work or have you studied? Who do you think of as major, major scholars in the TESOL field? So this happened a few years back when, um, at a conference in Brazil, I'm not going to name names, but um, all of the presenters were white males. All of the presenters were white males. And this brought about quite a bit of um, conversation, let's put it that way, um, among those of us who noticed uh, that that was a huge issue. Uh, the conference organizers didn't really think, I guess, much about uh, this as a problem. And they actually mentioned that uh, the publishers were um, sponsoring uh, most of the plenary speakers and they had selected um, who was going to be presenting. So, so why is this problematic? Okay, why are we talking about representation at conferences, for example, or in the books that you read um, and cite? Um, those of us who are um, considered from minoritized backgrounds here in the US context, for example, um, we have to fight this issue on a daily basis, uh, even including citations. So just this week, I picked up a book. Uh, I have a chapter in the book. And um, another chapter that was of a similar topic and in my area of work, um, did not have any citations of my work, for example. And I, I believe there was one other, one minoritized scholar uh, cited in that particular chapter. So we talk a lot about uh, decolonizing references or decolonizing your syllabi. And that's another topic for a different uh, plenary because it's quite complex, but it really means interrogating um, who is being included in your, uh, you know, if, if we have some students here of Letras, um, who is being included um, in your textbooks? in the articles and books that you're reading. Um, and I just saw somebody posting that there was a conference about African-American literature and no black scholars were invited to the opening plenary. So you, we see this um, permeated in education in, in a very significant way. So that's why I feel it's really important for us to be kind of questioning um, those practices, okay? What are also some racist ideas that permeate the TESOL field? And you can see the photo here um, on the side that re that represents um, British and American English, basically. So how do we question those ideas? So we usually have an ide idealized native speaker as models of language and not multilinguals. So this is an idea that is really pervasive in the field of TESOL. 
We also make assumptions about someone's language proficiency based on race. Typically, we have had an English-only mentality in the TESOL field, and also what we call a monolingual mindset. So remember that uh, quote from Ortega, uh, we talk about developing uh, a, a monolingual a second time around. I remember teaching in Brazil in the 90s, and I was told explicitly to avoid using Portuguese in the classroom at all costs because we needed to improve students' English language proficiency. And I'm going to be challenging that notion of avoiding using Portuguese in the classroom here today. And it is a bit controversial. I have presented this before in a couple of different places, this idea of moving beyond a monolingual mindset in TESOL, and that has been a little controversial. So um, I think that it is important though for us to consider uh, this piece. So another question is what principles and practices should guide the preparation of anti-racist ESOL teachers. So there are what I call some critical questions for us to consider. How do we prepare ESOL teachers to challenge and dismantle systemic racism and white supremacy? How can ESOL teachers critically examine and question representation in their curriculum materials. How can we ensure ESO teachers are exposed to diverse scholars and ideas? And how do we move beyond the idealized native speaker as a model of English language proficiency? And lastly, how do we develop a multilingual mindset? So these are what I call critical questions for us to be thinking about as we are discussing the preparation of anti-racist ESOL teachers. So I'd like to again go back to this and um, consider those um, those questions, okay? I'm hoping people will be interacting. I think, can we show the, the questions? Yes, there you go. Thank you so much. So how do we prepare ESO teachers to challenge and dismantle systemic racism and white supremacy? What are some ideas around that? How can we critically examine and question representation in our curriculum materials? How can we ensure ESO teachers are exposed to diverse scholars and ideas? How do we move beyond the native speaker as a model of English language proficiency? And how do we develop a multilingual mindset? So I'm hoping some of you can provide some ideas. I'm very good with wait time, so. <laughs> So the use of the second language is also important to make connections. So the, you mean the first language likely, right? So the, your second language is English. Your first language is going to be, in our case in Brazil, for the most part, uh, Portuguese, because there's also diversity in, of course, the first languages that are spoken in classrooms around the country. We have a lot of indigenous languages. We have American, we have uh, uh, Libras, right? The uh, sign language. Um, 
I almost said American Sign Language, but here that's that's here in the U.S. We we call uh, American Sign Language ASL. Um, so somebody's saying, "Oh, Jennifer, hi, Jen. Uh, I would love to see more English as Brazilian and others in our conversations and actions in teaching and research." Absolutely, and that's really the point of the conversation here today: is how do and how do we work with publishers to make them aware that they're really doing a disservice? Um, I think to folks because there are a lot of um, individuals from all over the world that we may interact with that have different variety that speak different varieties of english right different englishes as we call them um and the notion of world englishes uh dual language books in class extremely important yes absolutely um and how do we develop um, a multilingual mindset. That's exactly right. And I think in the field of TESO over time, we have really been focused on the teaching of English and have not really considered how to use the all the linguistic resources that our students bring to the classroom. So I think that's really a critical consideration. And I think now in Brazil, you, ha you have the new guidelines for bilingual education. And even though the document from the June version to the September version has really um, improved, uh, there are some incongruences, what I call incongruences, um, in the document. So those of us, those of us interested in bilingual education, I think, have noticed some things. Um, so they use the notion, which I am actually going to uh, to discuss uh, a little bit later. They discuss the notion. The notion. They use the notion of plurilingualism, but without really defining it and kind of um, really considering what plurilingualism really is. So uh, again, that's a topic for another <laughs> another plenary session, but I just wanted to mention that because it really is important to be considering how to develop a multilingual mindset and using translinguaging and using code switching. And you know, we do this a lot as bilinguals, right? So I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. So what are then some of these principles that I believe um, would help us develop anti-racist ESOL teachers? We need to challenge monolingual practices and the isolation of English from other languages represented in students' linguistic repertoire. We need to critically examine and question representation in our curriculum materials and change them. So if you stop buying some of these materials uh, <laughs> that do not have representation, I bet things are going to change, right? I think it's really up to us to be uh, questioning and critically examining uh, the kinds of curriculum materials that we have. We must use multilingual and diverse individuals as role models of language learning and development. Again, going beyond the idealized white native speaker, because we often see it's not just a native speaker, but it's a white native speaker that is considered a model of language. OK, so that's really, really critical for us to be thinking about. We need to work to dismantle systemic racism and white supremacy. And I think the principles that come before um, before this one specifically uh, really help us to address this one and embrace what we call plurilingualism. OK, what is plurilingualism? I think that's really an important concept that is used but not very well understood. Like I said, in the bilingual, the guidelines for bilingual education, they haven't been approved by Mackey yet, but um, they use this notion of plurilingualism 
but it's never really defined. So here I have a definition by Kanagaraja and Lineage saying, quote, plurilingualism allows for the interaction and mutual influence of languages in a more dynamic way than what we call multilingualism. It emphasizes the use of language as symbiotically interacting to generate new meanings. And it emphasizes the interrelation and interconnection of languages and language plurality. Okay. So some other notions here. We are all plurilingual. We use different registers with different audiences and in different contexts and situations. We use vocabulary from various languages. We participate in different situations that require different language choices. We also write in different genres that have different purposes. Okay, and I love this, uh, this picture here on the side. Uh, I'm bilingual, I speak English and cat. Uh, I, I I think that's really cute. I've used that in the past as well. So if you've seen me present before, uh, you've seen that before as well. So what does plurilingualism in ESO school context look like or should look like, right? Um, we can call it functional. Speakers use a repertoire of communicative resources for different functions. It's what we call language in use. Learners use plurilingual resources across languages. There is language transfer, which is positive. A lot of times in TESO over time, we have talked about language transfer as being negative, but we feel that it's really positive. There are possibilities to connect languages, to make connections, and to reinforce different concepts. We see plurilingualism as language as a resource. Classroom activities use translanguaging and code switching and make various languages visible. It is also about relationships. Uh, teachers and learners relate languages in their repertoire to each other when learning English. Again, it's this notion that what we bring to the classroom as people who know different languages, those resources are used then to learn English, okay? And in turn, you end up also learning more about the languages that you have already developed, okay? So I think that that's a really critical piece. So if we think about different practices, Okay, so what are some anti-racist ESO practices or teaching as plurilingual practice? We need to eliminate monolingual practices in classrooms, textbooks, and teacher education because we live in a multilingual world. We need to draw on our students' home languages in teaching. We need to challenge the monolingual principle of strict compartmentalization of languages in the classroom. We need to use fluid language practices that affirm linguistic and cultural diversity in and beyond the classroom. So these are all really critical pieces. And we also need to critically analyze everyday practices with an anti-racist lens, okay? So what am I doing in terms of addressing, for example, linguistic racism? When people make fun of our accents, right? From different regions of, of Brazil, for example, you can think about that. Um, sorry, I clicked too, too fast. Um, so when you think about making fun of different accents. And this is like all over the world, right? It's not just in one country. Here in the US too, there's, you know, there are different accents that we know all over the country and people make fun of different accents. So that is a racist practice. And I wanted to mention two different things that have happened to me personally. Um, 
one, the first time that I realized that or that I experienced linguistic racism here in the U.S. I was 22 and I had I had been admitted into a master's program in California. And there were different sections for writing. So for we had um, courses that addressed writing for native speakers and also non-native English speakers. And I remember that uh, the coordinator of the TESOL program, which is where I was studying under the master's in English, but uh, the option was TESOL specifically. So that person recommended me to teach a course, so to teach a writing course for um, native English speakers. The composition director at that time said, no, Luciana can't do that because she's a non-native English speaker. So that means she can only teach the non-native uh, sections of the course. And this was really interesting because I felt really discriminated against for being a non-native English speaker, right? For being um, bilingual, right? Um, and it, it still hurts to this day to talk about this experience because it was the first one and it was, it really, um, it really got to me, let's say. Um, but something else that happened, um, and I get emotional talking about it. Um, the chair of the English department, who was the first African-American, so the first black person to graduate with a PhD in linguistics from Stanford, he intervened and said, no, 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 no. We're going to give this course to Lou and I know she's going to do great. And I remember working so hard on that course, so, so hard, because I felt like I had to prove myself. It's painful. And for those of us who go through this on a daily basis, it is very painful. Now, at the end of that semester, it was actually a quarter system. So at the end of the quarter, I received the best course evaluations in the whole department. And I was so happy that my hard work um, paid off in the end, basically. And that was also when I decided to become a leader, to become chair of a department. And now I'm an associate dean. And hopefully one day I will be a dean. And that really changed um, my trajectory, my career trajectory here in the US. But as you can see, um, it's too painful to talk about it. I have many other examples, but this one was really critical. Um, in the way that I experienced linguistic racism and the way that um, it really influenced my career after that. And I was only 22, so you can imagine um, how that was. And I had just been here in the US for maybe six months. No, it was a little bit more, maybe a year. So um, I have many other examples. The other example that I wanted to, to give was this prominent uh, publisher. Um, we, I was at a conference in Bolivia and there were several of us from here from the US. This person is um, somebody who, who lives in Brazil and he, I think he's from the UK. I'm not, I don't remember exactly. Um, and he was presenting on a topic at this conference for Bolivian teachers of English. And he started making fun of 
Japanese accents. And it was really like people in the audience laughed at when he started making fun. Like he spoke English with a Japanese accent to make a point that, well, you all Bolivian teachers of English don't have to deal with a Japanese accent, basically, in English. Um, it really, ugh, I was so mad. And I had a friend of mine um, who was also presenting uh, next to me, Dor Dorothy Zermak. And she and I, like, I turned to her and I said, oh, my God. I can't believe this. I just can't believe this. And I can't believe this. And I decided not to say anything to this person, right? Not to create conflict. But to this day, this was two years ago, to this day, I find myself thinking about that moment and how my choice of not saying anything was um, was wrong, <laughs> was basically wrong. I really should have said something to the presenter and said, you know, what you just did is racist, is, you know, is a representation of linguistic racism. And I didn't do that. And I don't quite know why I didn't do that. Right away, I think I didn't have a chance to speak to him right after the presentation, but to this day, I remember that. And I remember that, and it bothers me a lot. And I think that when we see something, when we see racist practices, race, you know, racist um, ideas, being played out, and this this is really critical. We need to say something, right? Even though it may create conflict, I really feel like it's something that is really critical for those of us who are working with teachers and preparing teachers um, to be English teachers, right? So um, I want to end with. Paulo Freire, <laughs> of course. Um, educação não transforma o mundo. Educação muda as pessoas. E pessoas mudam o mundo. So, I want to challenge you today as you go through this conference today and in your work to really be a better person, right? To really be thinking about the people who go through these experiences. This is my contact information. And I have my website. And I will open for questions now. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think we have a few minutes, right? I think I did okay with time. <laughs> We do, we do. But thank you, Professor Luciana, um, for your very clear and thoughtful presentation. But we would also like to thank you for sharing your personal experience. It's very important to hear somebody's experience and to hear how they dealt with it. And I'm sure that it impacts people and it empowers people as well. So it was very nice um, to be able to. Um, I know it's a very moving situation, but it's it's, we're very happy that you shared it with us. It's so, very true. It's very true. I think for so yeah, many. There were a couple of comments. Uh, Great. I missed one. I'll get to. Um, I'd like to quote Marceli Alves' comment on this. I'll get back to this uh, when I find it because there are so many comments. Okay. Um, but you were, yeah, definitely you were right when you mentioned relations of power, racism, linguistic racism as issues that should be widely discussed in our classrooms and also in our teacher education programs, right? Um, mm -hmm. I agree with you when you say that there isn't much variety in teaching materials, native speakers and white people are still, um, they have still privileged places in the job market, in conferences. Yes. We need to decolonize our academic references, definitely. 
And systemic racism is something that we should really face um, because of its naturalized na nature, right? We feel um, it's just a comment, it's just something that people tolerate. And then if we don't talk about it as racism, we cannot find solutions to fight it. Um, I can give a personal um, example. I'm now in Quebec, in French speaking Canada. And I could, you know, say I could share a lot of examples um, in which bilingualism uh, is seen as something, you know, problematic sometimes. Or um, we usually see bilingualism as something peaceful, languages coexisting, but relations of power are everywhere, as you mentioned. So we need to be aware of them. Um, and examples of situations in which immigrants um, have been faced with difficulties because of the languages they speak or their command of language, uh, both French and English, for example. First Nation citizens, um, it is an issue as well here. And lately we've also had the death of a First Nation lady and this has yes. brought up the um, discussion again. So uh, these are very important questions, not only in the US, not only in Brazil, but as, as you nope. mentioned, All everywhere over. in the world. So I would like to say that many um, Letras professors and students are here with us today and they've made interesting comments. Um, I'll just get a couple of them, like Jessica Moraes um, said that I, she tells her students there is not only British and American English, but there is a variety of English around the world. Colleen, Colleen Ellis said that it should be remembered that English is actually a melding of many languages over a period of 2,000 years. The Absolutely. idea that anyone has a dominant or best version is just wrong. Professor Amalia Vargas from Sergipe said that she speaks Brazilian English. We speak Brazilian English. And so I'll bring two last comments so that you can, uh, I'll, I'll let you say something because Gustavo Paiva and Lucas we show to bring um, comments about these issues, but they bring very interesting um I think that we should we should talk about what they bring. Let me read the, their comments. The most important thing in a conversation is not the accent, but the understanding of the message. Also learning different accents and accepting your own accent. This is the first thing I would like you to focus on. And Luca Peixoto, also from Paraíba, says that it's funny because even parents come to us asking whether we teach American or British English and that this is the idea that they have. So I think there is a lot of pressure as well, social pressure. So could you talk a bit more or react to this idea of accepting your own accent and the pressure that we face, not only in the field, but socially speaking, like more broadly speaking? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So I think this notion of having accents, I think is really interesting because we think of perhaps the quote unquote native English speakers as not having accents, right? And it's really inadequate for us to be thinking that because every single person has an accent, right? So now I live in, in Virginia and I work with people from South Carolina, for example, and I can clearly see the different and hear the different accent that you know that this person has versus somebody else from Florida, for example, or from California. So I'm t I'm giving examples of the U.S., but look in Brazil. You know, all over. If you go from um, from the north of Brazil to the south, the, the accents are very, very different. And in Sao Paulo, which is where I'm from, I'm from the interior de Sao Paulo. So people with my uh, pronunciation of the R's, the way that we do the R's, are made fun of in soap operas, right, in the novellas. Uh, uh, people like in uh, news people, they try to control, quote unquote, the pronunciation of that R if they are from my part of the country because it is seen as something not not um um it's um it's it's not i'm forgetting the word so it's 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 not uh it's not a good thing right it's not uh it's um it's not seen as positive right it's seen as lower class for example you know it's really it's really critical to be thinking about accents and that 
everybody has an accent, right? And mm. I'm very proud of my Brazilian accent when I speak English. So I think it brings character to me. It is part of my identity as a Brazilian American. Um, and I, it's really, it's really important. So, th so that's about accents. Now, um, you mentioned something about parents asking if you speak, you know, it, do you address, um, do you use British or American English, right, in this particular school? So, again, we have to be challenging those notions of, okay, we have one variety of English, another variety of English, and that's all we have and we teach. So I think that we need to challenge those conceptions, not just with, t with ESO teachers, with those of us who are in the profession, but also with parents, that we have many different varieties of English, and we're trying to really incorporate different Englishes when we teach, because our students are not going to be interacting with only one country, right? We are going to be interacting with multiple users of English. So you can talk about uh, uses of English and how you are addressing different um, uses of English or different Englishes, if you will, um, in your school. Yeah, it just shows how pervasive um, racism is, right? Mm -hmm. Including mm -hmm. linguistic racism. So parents do have these expectations as well. So racism is everywhere, not just at schools, not just among us, and we need to, to fight it. Um, and it can totally relate to you when you talk about your sotaque do interior, <laughs> because um, we speak Northeastern uh, Portuguese. So we do face the, you know, the soap operas and people speaking yes. funny and all these things. So um, I'm very happy that you mentioned that because I think that we could start a discussion from our own experience, right? And then it's very close to us. It's not something that we relating to the language we're studying, the foreign language, the second language, but to our own language. So exactly, um, there's yep. racism everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple more comments here. Beatriz Albuquerque says that she's currently writing her thesis on identities representations, um, and she her context is the Programa Nacional do Livro Didático PNLD. Oh, yeah. PNLD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she studies the approved books, and she was very sad to see that 70% of the books published in 2016 just show white people in a country that has so much diversity, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you also a comment by Professor Elizabeth Sotomayor from our university, uh, in which she says that decolonizing the mind can be a hard task. And it depends on the kind of education our teachers have received in college. So can you comment on these two um, yes. comments, please? Yeah, so absolutely. So about the textbooks. So that's why I was talking about, you know, I started the presentation really uh, talking about these racist ideas, right? These racist practices uh, that happen in teaching. And if you don't have people in, uh, you know, as part of the programa, looking at, uh, at the textbooks from this critical perspective and asking those critical questions that I posed at the beginning, you are going to continue to perpetuate racist um, beliefs, ideas, and, and there, there is going to continue to be lack of representation. And we need to fight this with our publishers because the publishers are continuing to do this. So that's why it's so critical for, for us to be allies, right? We talk about being allies and being in this together because we do need to address um, the lack of representation. And it's not just putting in a token black person, a token Asian person, a token Latina, nothing like that. It is much deeper than just looking at representation. It really is about what is being included, what ideas are being included in these textbooks. Um, and 
also challenging monolingual mindsets, right? I think that that's also part of uh, a lot of, you know, uh, textbooks is this monolingual mindset. And part of um, English only initiatives saying, okay, you cannot use students' uh, first language in the classroom or home language, right, in the classroom. And that really is, I think, is a detriment to the teaching of English because we are, we need to draw on students' linguistic resources, everything that they bring. Because when we do draw on those experiences, um, we can learn a, a lot more we can contrast English and students' home languages. So let's say English and Portuguese, right? We can make connections. We can say, oh, we actually say this this way in English or these two different ways, right? So we can make lots of different connections. And I think that those are some of the things that we have to challenge our publishers on and our teachers and uh, our teacher educators as well. So that is that was the first question. Uh, the second question was about uh, decolonizing. Um, so I Would you like I, me to repeat the, yes, the comment. <laughs> yeah, she yes. says that decolonizing the mind can be a hard task, and it depends on the kind of education our teachers have received in college. Yes, absolutely. So what does decolonizing mean? Right. So uh, Brazil is a country that was colonized and we know from different practices within within Brazil that um, it's still being um, taken advantage of. Right. As we know, as a country. So I think that in terms of thinking about decolonization um, of your syllabi, of your references and of your you know, mindsets. So you really need to value what we have as Brazilians. Right. In terms of um, the resources. Right, what we have as resources, as coming from from Brazil or having grown up in Brazil, for example. So when you challenge these practices, these ideas, um, I I really do think that we can create better materials, we can prepare better teachers, and it takes time, I think, to be considering all of those things. And I, I believe that there are several people now in Brazil really focusing on decolonization, which I think is really, um, is really important. Um, I have some friends in Mato Grosso who work on, um, on this topic specifically. And I think we need to learn more from each other um, in this area and really fight again monolingual practices, because I think that that's really part of the decolonization practices, because when we have colonization, there typically was uh, the idea that there was one language that needed to be common across a country, right? So we also need to, so that's part of being plurilingual, right? It's really thinking about, okay, what does that mean? That that really meant, this process really meant the annihilation of multiple languages, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's my comment. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll just close our question and um, answers section by uh, quoting Marcelle Alves, who I mentioned uh, when I started. She says, Congratulations, Luciana. Thank you for sharing your story. It is inspiring. And I'm glad you had the strength to rise through that situation. You are amazing. I'm absolutely inspired by you. And as you said, um, you. education changes people. People change the world. And I'm quite sure that you inspired a lot of people here today. We're Thank very you. happy to have you here. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and nice to be with you all. Thank you. So now 
Stay with us for our recorded talks here on our YouTube channel. You have 30 minutes to watch the recorded talks of your choice. You'll be able to see the link to the playlist now in the chat. So choose your talk and enjoy it. We'll be back live at 11.20. See you soon. And thanks for the interpreters as well for your work. <laughs>